Let me first, uh, can you hear me? Okay, yeah, this is working, okay, thank you. So uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Klaus Molt. Uh, I'm the CIO of FICO. Uh, I've been with FICO for 18 months. Uh, me and my team, we're responsible for running our cloud infrastructure. Uh, we have a fair amount of customers on our cloud infrastructure. These are primarily banking uh, and financial services customers, but we also have uh, large telcos that's utilizing our services. Uh, and it's all mission critical services that we run. Uh, our customers expect the services to be up and running 24 by 7, 365. Uh, before I joined uh, FICO, uh, I also ran the uh, Salesforce infrastructure for around seven years um, and helped build that up. And I also ran the eBay infrastructure for around four years. So my background is really in large scalable infrastructures, uh, making sure that they are up and running on 24 by 7. What I'm going to cover today is a little bit about one of the implementations uh, where we use Couchbase, uh, and we're using that for a very large telco. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background of some of the services that we have and why the services are critical and how we use Couchbase and why we use Couchbase as well. So FICO, uh, most of you may know from the FICO score. Uh, the FICO score is something that's used probably in 90% of credit decisions in the US. Uh, it's when you apply for credit, whether you're going to buy a car or if you're doing a um, a buying a new house, or if you just apply for credit cards, we go and we do a background check uh, as part of reaching out to some of the credit bureaus, and then a decision is being made based on a set of rules, and then you get an answer or potentially an offer depending on what type of, um, of infrastructure that we have or type of service that's being uh, applied. But a lot of our business uh, is more than the FICO score itself, we actually have a significant, significant amount of analytics uh, service offerings uh, that we apply. And this one of, uh, one of these things that we apply, the service offering for the big telco, is actually based partly on Couchbase. Um, we also do a lot of fraud detection uh, and background checks. So when you walk through the airports, for instance, in the US, that's all handled by FICO. Uh, we help do and detect money laundering schemes for the government, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a lot of business analytics. We have, have a lot of machine learning technologies that we apply to our services. So let me give you a background of this particular client. It's a, it's a very, very large telco um, that wanted to build a new system. And that new system had to provide credit checks for any of the applicants uh, that, that came into either more than 3,000 stores that they have in the US or for online services. So they could apply for devices, they'll be getting an offer, and that offer will, based on your credit check, uh, tell you what you're eligible for. They expect high transaction volume, and by the way, high transaction volume in this case may not be the high transaction volume that I've been used to, a high transaction volume means that you probably get a transaction per second uh, during peak hours. But that transaction is a multi-step transaction. So it means that we actually have a request coming in. We may go out and require data from around six or seven different credit bureaus. It's large XML files that we get back. These XML files has to be processed and then we will have to make a decision. Those decisions has to be made extremely fast. We have to make those decisions within six to seven seconds uh, while, the, while the customer is either online or in the store. And of course they can't fail, right? Um, that means that you can't, uh, you can't really get the credit that you warranted. And another thing that you will see is if we have downtime on this particular solution, they will experience a significant amount of fraud and fraud for the telcos means that they can per hour lose in the order of one to two million dollars. Uh, you have people that's constantly just polling the interface and seeing how can I go in and get credits and buy services uh, or go in stores if anything is down. So it's pretty significant fraud losses if any of our systems are down. So we have to be up and running on a 24 by 7, 365. And then we had to build a solution that can scale for the future. Um, so what we started with, and this started about a little more than a year ago, where we set up uh, and uh, we started doing part of what is our standard technology. 
we normally, for a fair amount of customers, have active passive setup. So we basically mirror everything that they have in the primary data center, and then we replicate that to a secondary data center. A lot of the technology is using Oracle Rack. Um, uh, so we have, obviously, on every single tier, we have built redundancy in. You have, from the top, global load balancing. And again, the way that we provide it is using either VPN or multiple MPLS providers. In some cases, we actually have direct connects to our data centers from some of our, our, our vendors. But redundancy all the way from the top in terms, of, uh, in terms of network coming in, we can load balance the request on a global load balancer. And obviously, in an active passive, we'll see that most of the requests, uh, or all of the requests, is going to the active data center. Um, on the application tier, we run multiple different application layers. Uh, we have one that calls out basically to the credit bureaus. We have one that does the decisioning based on the feedback that we get from the credit bureaus. And then we have a service uh, that basically does, does send the request and update, et cetera, uh, to the back end service that we have. As I said, we run Rack. We run three node Rack clusters. So should we have failure on some of the Rack nodes, another Rack node will instantaneously uh, take over. And then we do log shipping, shipping of log from the primary data center to the secondary data center. So you'll find that all the transactions in a, is applied in near real time to the secondary data center. Um, if we have a failure in this scenario, what we have to do is to move the global load balancer from the active to the passive data center. We can normally do that in less than a couple of minutes. Uh, then we obviously have to ensure that we take the Oracle Rack out of the log application mode and we redirect traffic to the new data center while we figure out what's going on in the primary data center should we have an issue with the primary data center. A significant amount of our customers don't feel that is good enough. As you can imagine, if you lose a couple of million dollars per hour, you want to make sure that everything is up and running at any given point in time. So what we've done for these type of customers, and that's exactly how this particular telco is running, we have set it up so it's active-active. Uh, what active-active means is that we applied an Oracle technology called Golden Gate, and what that does is that it replicates transaction two ways. On the load balancing side, from the global load balancing, we will hit each data center in form of a round robin. So you'll actually see the transaction are distributed. And for me, that's the right way to run very critical, mission critical um, uh, infrastructures. Because you ensure that everything is working, right? There's never a surprise uh, in case that you had to fill over from an actor to a passive if there's a config configuration that didn't work, et cetera. You have to test that on a continuous basis. In an active actor scenario, you're guaranteed that transactions are flowing through the system uh, at any given point in time. So that's very important to us. The thing that you have to worry about in these scenarios is conflict resolution. So when you start setting these things up, you want to make sure that there is no transactions that can override uh, transactions that happen in a, another data center, right? So we have to make sure that we understand which objects are being replicated and if there's a chance of conflicts when we update the transactional part of the database. So um, we, we sorted all of that out very early on. But what we found was since we are generating a significant amount of payloads from the XML data that we get from the credit bureaus, we're talking about three to 400K in terms of XML payloads. And those payloads has to be recorded in the Oracle database and then shipped to the other side, the other data center. When we do that, uh, you start seeing things backing up if you're seeing an, an increase in volume because you simply can't replicate the objects fast enough the way that Oracle is working. So that's where we had to figure out what do we do to address this particular issue. So we took a look at uh, different technologies. Um, we looked at Couchbase, we looked at Cassandra, we looked at Mongo, uh, and did a few trial runs. We found that the replication technology across data centers for Couchbase was pretty superior to some of the other technologies that we evaluated, and especially for the, for the large workloads. So what we had to do was to add the Couchbase infrastructure to the way that we uh, do the transactions across multiple data centers. So in addition to having Oracle that will do the small type of transactional replication from data center to data center, 
we added a Couchbase cluster. And that Couchbase cluster initially was five nodes that we set up. It could easily keep up with the amount of transaction processing that we had. And remember, as I said, um, the three to 400K that we get for each of the bureaus that we call out to, that needs to be stored and then replicated. And we call out to five to seven different credit bureaus and collect all of that data. So it's a fair amount of data that we store. At this point in time, I believe we are up to close to three terabytes that we have, and we probably will increase it with another couple of terabytes every four to five months. Um, our clusters, by the way, at this point in time is up to 17 nodes, uh, and that is in less than 12 months. So you can imagine that we keep scaling and have to keep adding nodes to the Couchbase cluster. Um, and that works pretty well. There's a few things that we wish that we could do better, uh, and I'll get to that in a couple of slides. Um, the uh, couch-based replication, we, we really haven't seen any major issues with. Um, initially, uh, we got a lot of help from the couch-based team to help architect the solution. Uh, we knew that the, the way that we set it up was going to work, but we also added a few more things to it. We added uh, really the ability to store PDFs in Couchbase. It's really not what Couchbase is ideal for, but uh, we use that uh, to generate letters that we send to applicants, and then we store that. Uh, we are gonna pull that piece out and store that on an object store uh, over the next uh, probably six to seven months. For now, it works. And then we also store information about monitoring components in their uh, very, very small sets of data. So, um, if I, if I were to, to summarize why we use Couchbase, well, as I said, we evaluated the, the three technologies. And by the way, we do use the technologies in different scenarios, all three technologies in different scenarios and different solutions. But Couchbase, as I said, is far superior, very fast to, uh, replication technologies is really where it needs to be. Um, the other thing that we have found over time is that the availability has been extremely good. We have had not had downtime uh, for more than 12 months for the cluster, for the couch-based clusters. And we have added significant amount of things to it. Again, in this scenario, it may not be too bad because I can always just take down one side and upgrade and then do, do the same thing, make it active and then upgrade the passive side. So we can all control that from a load balancing side. But again, we haven't had to do that. It's running in an active active and it's running just fantastic. The other thing that we really liked about Couchbase, and I have to say this is probably the best support that I've had from a database or NoSQL uh, SQL vendor uh, out there. For those of you who run Oracle, you probably know how the support is there. Um, it's, uh, it's nowhere near like that uh, with Couchbase. We were actually very positively surprised when we went through the POC to see that Couchbase was so heavily engaged with the architecture and even before we went live, we were working closely with them, uh, and they had some concerns in terms of how the architecture was initially set up. Uh, we went through that with them, you know, in terms of how many index nodes we need to have, et cetera, uh, and the actual throughput. They wanted to make sure that we were good for the first six months. And uh, they pulled the team together, helped us out, and I think that was a very, very positive experience. And that's probably also what helped us uh, go live with absolutely no issues um, uh, whatsoever. Um, they have continued to support us in that fashion as well. So we are actively engaged with them. Uh, I think the nice thing is that we even have our sales guys uh, going in and telling these are some of the new features that we would like to see as part of Couchbase when we go forward. Uh, scalability is another big thing that we talk about. We, we do have a little bit of a wish list uh, in that area, but it is in general fairly easy to add nodes once we understand what needs to be done. I think we can be smarter about how you act, act no, or add nodes in an active environment. Um, and then uh, the thing that we're looking at right now is what else can we use Couchbase for? We, we've been actually so happy with them uh, that we signed a three-year enterprise agreement. Uh, so we think that we have other use cases that we're going to use Couchbase for as we go forward. So some of the things that we did discover as we went through this implementation um, and, and that we had to learn that we had to re-architect during, uh, during the time that the client has been up and running was the commit scope. So we uh, implemented initially Couchbase uh, sitting side by side by Oracle. 
And the way that we actually pulled in the data was that we wanted to store the XML data in, um, in Couchbase and then obviously take it out of Oracle. What we did find is that we implemented initially as a two-phase commit, meaning that we had part of the transaction that was recorded in Oracle and another part of the transaction, the XML document that was recorded in Couchbase. Sometimes we ran into issues on the Couchbase um, adopter from the client side that seems to be hanging. We never got to the bottom of it. We never got really an understanding if that was truly the driver. And, and I have to say to Couchbase's defense as well that we are running probably a driver that's nine months old. Uh, so we haven't upgraded that. That's something that we are, will be looking at. So the way that we had to implement it was that we still pull in the data now in Oracle from XML. We pull in the short description of the transaction into Oracle, but we don't replicate the XML. We just store it. So should something go wrong in the transaction, then we can reinsert it into Couchbase after the fact. So it doesn't become a two-phase commit after, uh, anymore. We, we record it all in Oracle. We do write it to Couchbase as a separate transaction. And then we validate the things has, has been replicated to the Couchbase uh, services. And at that point in time, we can delete it uh, through a batch job on the Oracle side. Um, so that was a way to get around it. And that has working, been working really, really well for us. We did also find that you know, storing PDF uh, is not the most ideal scenario for Couchbase. So we are setting up, as I said, an object store. It is causing us a little bit of performance issues to manage both of the things in different buckets uh, on Couchbase. Uh, so all of that is being pulled out. Monitoring is not that really a, a big of an issue, but monitoring will also pull out eventually and not store that just in Couchbase. So it's strictly XML data that we store. Yeah. Replication, as I said, that just works. That's just, I mean, that's the most impressive thing about it. And one of the things that I didn't show on the slides is that we are going to move to a three data center setup where we're going to go active, active, passive. Um, and we'll still have all the replication that's going on. And the reason why we go to a three data center setup uh, is should we ever have an issue in one data center, then we can activate the third data center so you still have a pair at any given point in time. And again, just think about it. If you lose a couple million dollars in an hour, it's well worth it to set up a third data center. Um, one thing also that I didn't mention is everything that we do has to be PCI compliant, right? So we also had to ensure that all the transaction flow, all the data, et cetera, is secure and is compliant and can be encrypted as, as we ship data between the different nodes. And then I did already mention that support has been superior to other DB vendors. So um, we are likely going to use, uh, well, not likely, we are going to use Couchbase for any implementation that requires large payloads and needs replication across data centers. It's, it's just ideal for it. It works like a charm. Um, having said that, we also would like to, for smaller clients, have the ability to do multi-tenancy on Couchbase. Uh, so one of the things that we would like to see is the ability to have more than 10 buckets. Um, we know that that is a restriction. It would be ideal if we could separate the uh, different customers uh, on different buckets. Um, but what we have to do is obviously limit it to 10 and then start setting up new clusters if we have to add additional smaller customers. Uh, from a manageability and scalability, that's not ideal. We would like to see more. Hopefully that'll happen over time. Um, we also, uh, the way that we operate, would like to have the ability not to have to store as much as we currently do in memory. And this is just because of the use case. As you can imagine, when I pull down XML, it's real-time credit applications. So I'm really only interested, likely, what happened in the last hour or two, right? They will go in and review the credit applications. They'll go in and review the data, et cetera. But after it has been approved or declined, at that point in time, we should just store that on disk. Uh, so, so it's really like a, a last couple of hour type of cache that we'd like to see. The cost of having in memory, and I understand why we do the in memory uh, from a replication standpoint, uh, is really not required in our use case. So if we could do more uh, disk and have less memory stored, that would be ideal. And I know the recommendation that Couchbase is laying out is about approximately 50-50 at a minimum. We have gone down to 25 and 15 in some cases. And by the way, it's working just fine. So, so whether it's supported or not, um, it's working. 
The other thing that we would like to see is support for load balancing um, to allow nodes to be added uh, really automatically. And although we can add nodes to the clusters, what we have to do on the client side is for each new node that we add, we have to specify the configuration and the pointer to the new node when we add that from a client perspective. So uh, similar to what you may have, for those of you who are familiar with Oracle, they have a listener where you just set it up, right, and you can add things to the right cluster and it automatically distributes that from a uh, load balancing standpoint. That would be a great feature to have as part, of the, um, as part of the infrastructure. And then the last piece is encryption. Uh, we would actually love to see encryption, and, and you can obviously imagine why that is important to us from a PCI standpoint. We have to store data at rest encrypted. Um, the way that we have to do it is to apply third-party technologies to it. Uh, it would be great if that was part of the couch-based clustering. Um, right now, it's just extra cost for us to do that, and we use uh, Wometrics to do that uh, on the disk standpoint and that obviously will uh, enable us to encrypt what we need to encrypt. So with that, I think that is really the description of how we use Couchbase, uh, our journey. I think it has been a very, very positive experience. I know that we're gonna do a lot more with Couchbase uh, as we move forward. Uh, we are pretty excited about some of the announcements that was being made today. Um, but I'll open up with questions, and by the way, there's uh, two gentlemen here uh, on the front a row as well, George Chen and Rick Newell, uh, that has been working the with the technology for the last year. They'll also be more than glad to help uh, answer any of the questions. I assume you'll be more than glad to help answer any questions. Uh, otherwise, I'll volunteer them. Um, but, uh, but they have been working on the implementation, uh, the wish list, and very closely with the couch base. And I, I assume you guys uh, have the same feeling, right? It's been a pretty positive experience compared to other database technologies. So I'll open up for questions if you have any questions. Yes. Yeah, so, so the question is, can I, can I speak a little more to the two-phase commit problem that we have between Oracle and Couchbase? So um, initially, uh, when, we, uh, when we set up the infrastructure uh, to write the XML data, as I said, we wrote just the metadata into Oracle and then the XML data into Couchbase. What we found was, so, so some of the things that we're monitoring is how long the transaction are taking because we have SLAs that we have to adhere to in terms of, this, uh, in terms of the transaction time. And uh, on occasion, we saw, and this is back to what I talked about, the client driver, we saw that there was um, threads from the client drivers that was hanging. Uh, it didn't happen often, but it happened frequently enough, and, and, and by the way, we are probably pretty uh, uh, particular about monitoring these things. Uh, we get on a bridge if you see more than six timeouts in 15 minutes, right? And, and as I said, we probably run between 40 and 60 transactions per minute. So if you have any type of timeout, that becomes critical to the client. We, uh, we started looking at the client-side driver and trying to understand what was going on. We actually got some help uh, from uh, Couchbase as well. We never found out what was really causing it. It may have been something uh, to do with OpenShift as well, where we're running it from. Um, we are still digging into that area, but to get around it and get around it fast, that's when we separated the transactions. Um, it was a pretty, or fairly easy tweak, right? Just to write it, uh, but not replicate it to Oracle, and then delete it after the fact. Uh, we just couldn't go on for an extended period of time without understanding that. I have to say, though, we have experienced a little bit of the same issue, even though we don't have two-phase commits, where we're just seeing some of the threads hanging occasionally, and we still haven't gotten to the bottom of that, uh, why, that's, why, why that is actually happening. So although it's much less frequent when we, uh, compared to when we had the two-phase commits. I don't know if that, that answered your question. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, yes, sure. So question is, do we have plan to move into the cloud? All we do is cloud. So my team only uh, does cloud. So I was hired to just do cloud. That's my background. Um, we, we do have a pretty big business, obviously, on-prem. But uh, we are running that in our own data center that we have you know, cloudified. Um, 
you, uh, we, we are going to AWS in a big way. I just gave a talk at the AWS Summit about what we're doing with that. That's online if, in case you want to you know, see that. Um, that was happening in New York about a couple of months ago. Um, and um, you know, it's, it's just a natural evolution, right? Uh, you go from your uh, cloud, the private cloud, to the public cloud. You can move faster. We have to rewrite a lot of the things. Uh, and obviously, Couchbase is going to be a part of that. These are all our own colo facilities that we that we run this from. Yes. So in this case, it's not cloud. Uh, it's not. I shouldn't say that. In this case, it's not AWS or public cloud. Yes, it's private cloud. There's a question over here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No. No. This is strictly in terms of so. So some of the things that we do for very large clients, we ensure that they just have a single um, architecture. You know, they're not shared, right, with any of the smaller. But to make it more cost effective, at that point in time, we talk about multi-tenancy, both on the Oracle side as well as the Couchbase side. We normally want to separate that. And some of the things that, that we look at from a multi-tenancy standpoint is that we would like to have the access patterns defined by public-private keys, right? And then you probably put a single client in a single bucket. Uh, so you don't have any, any OLAP. The fact that you have a limit of 10 buckets limits us to 10 clients, right, on, on this particular one, assuming that we don't use the bucket for other things, like we do one bucket for PDF, et cetera. Um, so obviously, I've been used to scaling to hundreds or thousands of clients on a single infrastructure, which is, makes it more manageable. After I've surpassed 10, then I have to set up another cluster. I mean, you can still do it, but it's just overhead in terms of manageability and, and performance and all that good stuff. Yeah, so the question is, how do I find the monitoring capabilities of Couchbase? I'll probably let you, uh, actually, I don't know if you can speak loud enough, uh, uh, answer that question. Monitoring on Couchbase, um, do you find, I mean, we, I should say one thing. We, we are using, um, or just started to use, an APM for it, which makes the monitoring a lot easier and look familiar, whether you're running Oracle or Couchbase. It, the interface will look pretty much the same. Um, these are uh, technologies like uh, AppDynamics or New Relic. Uh, they'll go in, and it will also help you in general to get a full end-to-end -end understanding and flow and timing of each of the transactions since this is being logged. So that's, that is what we're using uh, to identify any issues very fast. Then we use the specific monitoring for each of the components to dig deep if there's anything that has been identified in a particular area. And that obviously uh, enables us to identify the issue and then dig deep uh, to resolve any issues. Any other comments in terms of monitoring? Uh, you, you can speak in. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, so I think for our monitoring uh, use case, I think it's very specific. So I think it works with Couchbase very well if we compare to Oracle, you know, like the queries that we have to write. So we, we're using the Nico uh, feature and the index query services. So if we have to do that in Oracle, I think, you know, it would have been a, a lot more difficult to do in terms of, you know, the type of complexity. Um, Oh, monitoring. Um, we so 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 we are using um, Zap. So it, to for us is, you know, we 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 use the monitoring monitoring tool called Zapix, and it already comes with uh, the Couchbase plugin. So it's pretty easy to uh, to do. And then also anything that's not covered by that plugin, you know, because uh, Couchbase has API calls, pretty extensive API calls. It's very easy to bank, uh, you know, to add any additional ones. So, so maybe add one more thing, right? Uh, uh, Oracle has uh, the Oracle Enterprise Manager, right? So they have a lot of things that's from a UI is out of the box and, yeah. and, and probably easier to dig in. Um, for us, we try to standardize since we use a lot of different technologies. So it's one pane of glass, one set of things that we can look at. So a lot of our, our ops guys are really DevOps guys that prefer to have the APIs. So we can tie into the APIs and then have a common interface. So the way that we actually set up, we use Sabix. Sabix has alert us. It goes through service now. We have a queue. 
and that's how we act on things in general. And then we can drill, drill in based on the specifics that we set up for each of the technologies, if that makes sense. Okay, one more question, I think, uh, then we're out of time. Uh, you mentioned earlier about more technology. Yes. Yes, you know, ideally we are looking for all of it, right? So I'm, use, uh, I'm looking for security isolation, as I said, per tenant. It would be nice to have, as I said, private public keys so that you can only access, you know, a tenancy. Uh, others will do it, you know, using the old tricks where you just have a ID that is tenant specific for every single record that you store, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's, you're right, it's, it's more than just, just the buckets. We would like to be able to control the resourcing so we can ensure that there's no noisy neighbors uh, effect, right, that we are seeing. Uh, that's pretty common. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of folks will do that by having an abstraction layer where they control the access from that standpoint. The more you can build into the tool or the backend technologies uh, by itself would obviously be preferable, right? That, that, that is what helps the more modern technologies, if that makes sense. Okay, with that, thank you very much. Uh, and if you have any other questions, feel free to, to talk to any of us. Uh, I hope to see a lot of you on this conference and, and learn more. Thank you.